Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning in Australia. Hi, everyone that is uh, attending this conference. Welcome to the keynote speech by Joshua Sinner from James Cook University in Australia. He will be presenting uh, Locating and Learning from Bright Spots Among the World's Coral Reefs. Professor Sinner is perhaps one of the best examples of transdisciplinary science leaders. He has been working for some years on understanding how the social, economic, and cultural factors affects the way in which people use, perceive, and govern natural resources with emphasis on marine and coastal ecosystems and their services. He has published almost 150 papers and currently is full professor at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at the James Cook University. I am very glad to have Professor Sinner in our conference. Welcome, Joshua. Okay, let me uh, share the screen then. Uh, it is um, not only an honor and a pleasure to be here, but it's also a convenience too. I was able to drop my kid off at daycare on time and uh, give a plenary talk. So thanks very much. It's a, it's a new format for me and uh, here's to hoping it, uh, it all goes well. So scientists often spend their careers looking at averages and trends, and this is often really important for discerning the signal from the noise. But today, I'm gonna to highlight an approach to informing coral reef conservation that's focused on identifying and learning from outliers, specifically outliers that are doing well despite difficult conditions. Now, by their very nature, outliers deviate from expectations and consequently can provide novel insights into confronting complex problems where conventional solutions have failed. And the classic example of this comes from Save the Children, an NGO in Vietnam. And they were working on the nexus of poverty and childhood malnutrition. And as you can imagine, these two issues are very tightly coupled with poorer children being more malnourished than their wealthier counterparts. Now, what Save the Children did that I thought was extremely inspiring was they looked for the bright spots. They looked for the poor children that were not malnourished. And they investigated why they, why they were bright. So they asked their mothers what they were doing differently from other mothers in the village. And it turns out they were, they were doing quite a few things, but those included finding little crabs and shrimp in the rice fields and, and grinding them up and putting it in the rice. They were also feeding their kids three times a day instead of the customary two. Now, they weren't giving their kids more food they couldn't afford to, but by breaking up the meals into smaller portions spread more evenly throughout the day, the children were better able to absorb the nutrients within. Now, Save the Children then had these mothers become um, uh, sort of teachers in the village and teach other mothers how to, how to uh, do these practices, and then had these villages become sort of living laboratories and have uh, uh, mothers from other villages come in. They ended up cutting childhood malnutrition by 65% in project villages and reached over 2.2 million households. Now, this type of positive deviance or bright spot analysis has been used in fields such as business and health and human development to uncover local actions and governance systems that work in the context of widespread failure. And it holds much promise in informing conservation. So we use this approach to examine reefs that for all intents and purposes should have been degraded, but aren't, and to see what we could learn about what they were doing differently. So here's a little bit of a, of a roadmap of my, uh, of my talk today. Um, I'll, I'll, warn you, <laughs> I'll warn you in advance that this talk's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit weird at times. I'm gonna be talking about a very broad range of issues, ranging from uh, uh, childcare to colonoscopies, not my own, don't worry. Uh, so it, it's gonna be very far reaching. Um, but uh, so the first part of the talk will uh, we'll be defining the sort of expectations. And then a little bit of a spoiler alert, one of the key drivers of change my group has uncovered um, on coral reefs is really this role of markets, the important role of markets in structuring uh, uh, the condition of coral reef ecosystems. So I'm going to do a little bit of a kind of a detour and talk a bit about this um, in, in a lot more detail and talk a little bit about sort of the frontiers of research in this domain that my research group is, is getting into. 
Uh, we'll then talk about locating the bright spots and then delve into what makes a bright spot bright. And in this part in particular, I will do a bit of a, a deep dive into uh, one bright spot in particular that I've been working for a, a very long time. So let's get straight into the, the defining the expectations. So, you know, these issues of, of, of sustainable environmental governance are really too big for any single discipline to solve on its own. And so I've been leading a working group of nearly 40 scientists from a range of disciplines to rethink how we need to confront the coral reef crisis. Um, now, you should know that I, uh, I take interdisciplinarity very seriously. Um, and although I didn't marry an ecologist, I, uh, I did get married by one. For those of you that don't know, this is uh, Tim McClanahan, a, um, a giant, both uh, literally and figuratively in, uh, in, in uh, coral reef ecology. Uh, and my groomsmen were also uh, coral reef ecologists as well. So it's safe to say that uh, interdisciplinarity is, is, is truly close to my heart. Um, so I, I, started, uh, I started this process simply by uh, requesting that um, 40 different scientists just uh, give me their life's work. <laughs> and if you've, if you've ever met a scientist, you'll know that uh, getting them to hand over data is a lot like um, pulling teeth. But uh, fortunately, my dad was a dentist, so the extraction actually went, went really well, and we ended up uh, with an unprecedented 7,000 surveys from 2,500 reefs in 45 countries. Now, uh, just to be clear, this is the largest study of its kind ever conducted. And, you know, to be honest, what I think actually really helped this was the fact that I'm actually a social scientist by training. And so when I was asking a bunch of coral reef ecologists for their, their life's work, they weren't actually really threatened that I was going to do anything that they were doing, that the space that I was working in was so unique for them. It was, it was only additionality and people were incredibly interested in, in, in collaborating on this. So at each of our, uh, uh, of our reef sites, we looked at a range of indicators of reef ecosystem conditions. These include things like fish biomass, the presence of top predators, um, uh, potential parrotfish grazing, and a metric of trait diversity, and that kind of measures how biomass is spread out across different traits, things like home, large versus small home ranges, uh, their position in the water column, how big the fish are, whether they're uh, diurnal, nocturnal, et cetera. Now, 95% of what I'll be talking about today is really just about fish biomass, and this is to me, this is a really cool sort of social ecological indicator because on the, the ecological side, it reflects a, a broad selection of ecological functions. But on the social domain, it really represents the resource availability. It's what's available for people to, to, to kill and eat, right? Uh, so for that provisioning service, it's really important. So this was the distribution of, uh, of fish biomass in our sites with the small red dots, meaning there's virtually no fish there and the big green dots, meaning that there was lots and lots and lots of fish there. Uh, we then wanted to predict the amount of fish on a reef based on key social and environmental conditions using a Bayesian hierarchical model. Uh, now in that model, we included a range of environmental conditions. Now these are, to me, what I call my nuisance parameters. These are things that, as a social scientist, I'm not at all interested in, but they're things that I just need to control for. And these include things like productivity, depth, habitat, uh, the type of sampling, uh, me measures of connectivity. We also looked at a range of larger scale socioeconomic drivers, things that are happening at sort of the national national level, the national context. And this includes things like the level of human development, um, uh, the national population size, a metric of, of uh, the quality of, uh, of governance, the amount of reef fish landed, and a measure of um, tourism arrivals relative to the local population. We also looked at a range of local scale socioeconomic drivers. These include things like the type of management that's in place, and the degree to which it's complied with. We looked at a measure of population growth, human population growth within the surrounding uh, area, a metric of, of local pressure, 
and a, a metric, metric of potential market interactions, which I'll explain in a bit of detail in, in just a moment. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the details of, of which ones were significant and, 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 and all of that. That's pretty boring. But I think the, the real interesting and important thing to note was that the strongest predictor of reef fish biomass globally was our metric of potential market interactions. But it was not only a great predictor of reef fish biomass, it also was able to predict the presence of top predators, parrotfish grazing, and trait diversity. So these potential market interactions were the most consistent socioeconomic predictor of ecological conditions on coral reefs. So what I'd like to do now is kind of uh, delve into this uh, a, a little bit and, and really talk about the role of markets in the environment and some of the frontiers in, in this space. Now, to measure potential market interactions, we use something that uh, all of us are familiar with every second of every day, unless you've been to space, and that's gravity. Now, if you remember from high school physics, right, the gravitational pull that something exerts is its mass divided by its distance squared, right? Well, since the 1880s, economists have used this, this notion of gravity, which they also call interactance, to predict trade and migration flows. And it's often been considered the most successful model in economics, but it's not really been applied directly in natural resource management context. So we developed a gravity metric that captures potential market interactions with reefs based on the human population size, right? That's the analog of the mass and the metric of accessibility, right? In this case, we use travel time, which took account things like the, the, uh, the land cover it was on, whether there was dirt roads or paved roads. Um, uh, so we didn't just measure distance in terms of how the crow flies. We measured it and actually how long it would take uh, to get there. And we did this at the nearest market, which was typically a port or provincial capital or kind of major city. And this essentially measures the gravitational pull of a market on a reef. So let's just take a quick look and see what this relationship looks like. So on the x-axis there, it ranges from low market pressure to high market pressure. And on the y-axis, it ranges from having uh, no fish on the bottom to having lots and lots of fish uh, on the top. So what we can see clearly is the amount of fish on a reef. These are sort of national level averages there. The amount of fish on a reef declines um, uh, as the amount of uh, a market, as market gravity increases. And in fact, there's four times more fish on reefs that are far from markets than reefs that are near markets. And this is critical because markets are expanding, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, they announced that the capital of Indonesia was going to move from Jakarta into what's uh, basically a remote part of uh, Borneo. I mean, this looks like a little village crossroads, and that's going to be the new capital of, of Indonesia. In the South China Sea, previously um, uninhabited atolls are, are being developed. Um, and if you haven't heard of, the, of China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, you haven't been paying attention. This is the largest infrastructure project in human history set to reorient global trade to China. It includes three silk roads on the, ter the terrestrial side and a maritime silk road as well, which is going to be uh, a massive infrastructure development of, of ports throughout the whole region. So we know that markets are having a really big role on the environment. But the key question is, what can we do to reduce or dampen their effect? And I think this really first requires understanding how markets can lead to exploitation. You know, I think it's well established that uh, uh, price and price variability can create incentives for, uh, for exploitation. So for example, uh, when a paved road increased market access to a fishing village in Nicaragua, the more stable prices that people received for their fish meant that people were able to switch from being seasonal to full-time fishermen, ultimately leading to considerably more fishing pressure. However, it's what we're just now learning 
that's much more interesting and where I believe the potential for fundamental change lies. There's an emerging body of research in the fringes of both behavioral economics and philosophy that's beginning to study how the very presence of markets changes the way that humans behave. And this can have big impacts on the environment. Let me explain. Much of human behavior is governed by social norms that determine what a society thinks is acceptable or not. And we're finding that the introduction of markets can displace or crowd out these social norms, potentially leading to unforeseen or perverse consequences. Now, let me give you an example that has nothing to do with the environment, but many of you may be able to relate to. And um, in fact, it was very relevant to me even today. So uh, this is one of my boys, this is Ezra, and both he and his brother uh, go to daycare. Now, many daycare facilities around the world have a problem with parents being late to pick up their children. So in Israel, some daycare centers decided to do something about it and impose fines for being late. So as it turns out, the incidence of late pickups nearly doubled. What happened? Well, prior to the fines, uh, social norms made parents feel bad for picking up their children late. But the fines created the idea of compensation for the extra time, displacing the ethical obligation to be punctual. Now, a few extra dollars to enjoy that latte and catch up on the gossip with your friends is totally worth it, right? It's just the, just the cost of daycare. It becomes internalized in that. Importantly, three weeks later, when the fines were reversed, the elevated rate of late pickups persisted. So once eroded, this moral obligation was hard to revive. So we know that markets can affect three areas of human behavior that have direct relevance to the environment. And so um, uh, one of the most, I think, important ways that markets can crowd out pro-environmental behavior is by reducing people's propensity to engage in collective action or engage in civic duties. Now, I'll give you another example of this, also from Israel. Now, there, every year, school children take one day off and go out and raise money for charities. Well, some behavioral economists decided to get involved in this and create different treatment groups. So they had one group that just went out and collected money for charity as they normally do, one group that got a 1% commission, and one group that got a 10% commission. Well. As it turns out, right, the group that got nothing performed the best, right? This is standard, this is contrary to standard economic theory, right? Um, uh, so in this case, money crowded out the norms of civic duty and changed the character of the activity from a good deed to a job for pay. And here, merely commodifying the service was enough to erode it. Now, interestingly, what the economists found, though, was that the group that did the worst was the group that got the 1% commission. So the group that got 10% commission did worse than the group that got no commission, but better than the group that got one. So the, the, the authors were quite cheeky and said something like, if you're going to pay someone, make sure you pay them enough. Now, emerging research suggests that markets can also affect people's willingness to inflict indirect harm on others. And this is what's often referred to as negative or third party externalities. Now, markets can also affect people's preferences for social equity or fairness. Now, critically, some of these, such as collective action, are actually the very foundations of most community-based approaches to conservation. And these can be undermined by markets in ways that we're, we're simply not paying attention to. And you know, even worse is that there's a whole branch of conservation called market-based instruments that create new markets in the provision of environmental goods or in the avoidance of environmental harm. How ironic that these market-based conservation instruments could be eroding some of the foundations of conservation itself. So I think the key question is really whether and how we can present pre prevent the potential displacement of collective action, of equity, and intolerance for externalities. So the first step in doing this, I believe, is better understanding the mechanisms through which crowding out occurs, right? 
And so there's three mechanisms that have been, been proposed on this before. And the first is the notion of um, displacing internal motivations with external motivations, right? When you put a price on something that becomes an external motivation rather than it being an internal motivation. There's also the notion of a diffusion of responsibility, right? So in market contexts, right? People are no longer necessarily having typical face-to-face -face interactions with one person. It's diffused through the market and supply chain, which creates a sort of diffusion of responsibility. And there's also the notion of framing. And framing is the principle that our choices are influenced by different wordings, settings, and situations, right? And so even being involved in a market framing or a market context can make people sort of behave in the ways that they think buyers and sellers should behave. The second step, I think, is then determining whether we can develop countermeasures that get coupled into conservation initiatives. Can we couple conservation with measures that foster intrinsic motivations or reinforce individual responsibility? So my research group is beginning to sort of explore some of these ideas and, and particularly looking at the role of framing in uh, uh, collective action. So what we, what we used to do this was what's referred to as a public goods game. This is something that, uh, that economists often use to uh, measure cooperation. Now, uh, interestingly, um, most of the time when economists do this, it's done in a laboratory setting in a university. Um, we ended up doing this in fishing villages in both Papua New Guinea and in, uh, in, in Chile. So for those of you who aren't familiar with public goods games, um, basically, you have a range of players in this, in this hypothetical example, there's three, uh, and they contribute to a public good, right? So in this case, everyone gave six dollars. Um, and then what typically happens is that public good gets multiplied. In this case, I've just hypothetically said it gets doubled, right? Uh, oh, so, so it goes from 18 to 36, and then it gets sent back equally to each player irrespective of their initial contribution. So in this case, everyone gave $6 and everyone gets $12 and everyone's excited. Um, and an alternative uh, game, alternative round, maybe player one gives $6 and players two and three give nothing. Uh, so the public good uh, grows to 12 and then everyone gets $4 back. Player one's pretty disappointed and players two and three are pretty excited because they gave nothing and got $4. So what we did was we did a variation on this public goods game. We had a control, but we also had two treatments. And one, right, before they did the public good game, they played a market game. And in the other, before they played the public good game, they, uh, they played a trust game, right? And so I won't bore you with the details of what these actually entail, but these are, are relatively common uh, experimental economic games. Um, and what we found was not what we expected. It was, it was more nuanced than we expected. We found that framing had a big impact on cooperation, but it actually, it didn't depend on the pre-game context. It depended on the role that you played in each game. So in the market game, there's buyers and sellers, and these had very different the buyers had very different contributions to sellers in the next game. And likewise, in the trust game, there's senders and receivers. And both senders and receivers had very different um, contributions to the public good. So it actually depended really on what role they were playing rather than what, what broad framing they were in. And if you're interested in this, you could read more about it in... Um, a recent paper we just uh, published in Ecological Economics, it's, uh, it's an open access paper. So uh, feel free if that's interesting. So let's head on to the next part of the talk, which is about locating bright spots. Now, so we had our model, which was kind of the basis for our expectations. And we used these to find the places that were doing better than expected given the socioeconomic conditions they were exposed to, right? These are the reefs that were essentially punching above their rates and their weight. And in Nerdish, this is essentially the deviations after having accounted, excuse me, <clears throat> for covariates. Now we use two standard deviations from expectations as a conservative 
definition of what an outlier was, right? So if you remember from uh, uh, your sort of first statistics class, uh, one standard deviations where about two thirds of the data lie and two standard deviations is where 95% of the data lie. So we were looking for, uh, for bright spots, for outliers that were really, you know, outside of where 95% of the data uh, were. So our bright spots were primarily concentrated in the Pacific and they occurred in both remote locations, but also mostly in populated places, including Tabuera, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and parts of Indonesia. Now, one of the things I do want to emphasize, though, is that uh, this is a, a relative, not an absolute uh, term. And so some of the bright spots we had had biomass levels that were below the global mean. And this can sometimes be hard, particularly for, for some of the ecologists that I, I've worked with, to get their head around because they feel like, well, a bright spot should be the place that has the most fish. That's the brightest, that's the brightest spot. And in this case, what we're doing is, is a bit different than that. We're looking for the place that maybe it doesn't have the most fish, but we would predict that it would have almost no fish. And so, uh, so we're looking for the place that's doing better than it should be, not the place that's just doing the best in absolute terms. Well, we also identified the dark spots, right? These were the places to, uh, to avoid. And you know what I what I like about this approach is I feel like it kind of challenges some expectations. It certainly challenged some of mine. You know I think uh, in the the global coral reef context, uh, the the Caribbean is often considered the world's basket case for coral reefs. Um, the reefs have been profoundly degraded throughout the basin, uh, with a, with with you know a few minor exceptions. Um, things are are looking pretty grim overall. But what we found actually was the condition of Caribbean coral reefs by and large were entirely predictable based on the conditions that they were exposed to. And I think this is kind of a, you know, a warning shot for places like Australia that are really interested in developing um, uh, the Northern Queensland area where, where we are now. Uh, that you, you know, there's nothing that uh, uh, makes our reef immune to it. It's the places like the Caribbean are, are very predictable. And there's a couple of minor exceptions there, right? I mean, I think there was two or three bright spots in the whole Caribbean. The, um, incidentally, one of these bright spots, the one in Jamaica, uh, is literally where I worked for two years. I was um, a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in the Montego Bay Marine Park. And uh, one of the dark spots was literally the closest coral reef to the house that I lived in for two years. And, Having spent quite a bit of time there, I'm actually not terribly surprised that it is a, uh, that it is a dark spot. Um, you know, also uh, some of the really um, remote areas, places like the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are often considered pristine and people think about these as sort of baselines for, um, for how good reefs could be. Well, you know, what we found is, yeah, sure, there's a lot of fish there, but not as much as you'd expect for a place that's extremely remote in a, in a marine reserve, um, in, a, in a country that's got uh, uh, enough funding for, for uh, proper governance of, of natural resources. All right, so, you know, on to the, the, the final uh, part of today's talk, which is really about what makes a bright spot bright. And so um, as a hypothesis generating exercise to um, begin uncovering why bright and dark, dark spots may diverge from expectations, um, we sampled data providers who, uh, or we surveyed data providers who'd sampled the sites and other experts with firsthand knowledge about the presence or absence of 10 key social and environmental conditions at the 15 bright spots, the 35 dark spots, and 14 what we're calling average spots that performed most closely to model specifications. So what we found in terms of sort of environmental conditions, that bright spots tended to have deep water refuges nearby, right? They were places where basically fish could dive down and um, escape from fishing pre pressure and potentially escape from um, uh, from effects like, uh, uh, you know, marine heat waves where it's cooler. That's disputed a little bit in the literature, 
Um, but what we do know is that, that uh, bright spots tended to have that, um, uh, have deep water refuges nearby. Conversely, dark spots tended to have had um, recent, within the past five years, uh, environmental shocks such as coral bleaching or a cyclone. And I think this latter finding is particularly worrisome in the context of climate change, where um, we're predicted to have more frequent um, uh, marine heat waves and more intense tropical cyclones. So we also found that there were key differences in the technologies used between bright spots and, and dark spots. And dark spots tended on average to use more intensive netting, such as beach seine nets, which can damage the, 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 um, uh, the coral habitat on which the fish depend. And they were also more likely to use freezers, fish freezers, which allowed them to stockpile fish to send to market. Now, alternatively, um, uh, in terms of the social and institutional conditions, bright spots tended to have higher levels of dependence on reef fisheries. Um, now, this finding may seem a little bit counterintuitive, right? Many people would think, well, shouldn't they have lower levels of, of dependence on reef fisheries? And, you know, decades of research on common property institutions really suggests that where people's livelihoods depend on it, they're more likely to uh, invest in, in, in solutions. And I think that's what we've seen here. There were also higher levels of engagement by local people in resource management. And there were higher um, sort of, uh, um, um, uh, there were more sort of cultural practices and connections uh, with the reefs. And these were in the form of things like uh, marine tenure systems and local taboos. So what I'd like to do now is uh, sort of really spend the rest of the talk talking about one bright spot in particular and really go into some of these social and institutional uh, mechanisms a bit. And that bright spot is in Papua New Guinea. Uh, in particular, it's on a place called Karkar Island, which is about 40 kilometers from the provincial capital of Medang. Now, Karkar Island is, um, uh, it, it's kind of what I think everyone's sort of vision of a tropical island paradise is. Like when you have this vision in your mind of like this perfect volcano rising up out of the sea with amazing rainforest and reefs and, you know, it, like inside the volcano is a volcano that's smoldering. It's just one of the most magnificent places I've, I've, I've ever really seen. And on the, the eastern side of it, I've been uh, working in, in, in uh, two villages there in particular, Maluk and Wadao. And I've been collecting social and ecological data there since 2001. Now there, they use a rotational closure system. And this means the reefs are closed for somewhere between two and eight years. They don't really have a, it's not really set in law, it's very adaptive. They, they close it for a certain amount of time and they, they meet regularly to figure out when it's gonna be open, but they don't start by saying, we're gonna close it for five years. They close it and then they, kind of adaptively monitor it and then decide. So um, now it's practiced by these two communities uh, as well. So this creates an interesting design. And let me, let me go through it with you a little bit. So these are the two, two villages there. Um, and in 2001, when we started uh, going there, the reefs in front of Maluk were closed to fishing. Now those red dots are actually the reefs that the, the ecologists on the team surveyed. So those are the the sites that we, we uh, keep, keep going back to visit. So the reefs in front of Maluk were closed to fishing and the reefs in front of Wadao were open to fishing. In 2009, it was the same thing. The reefs in front of Maluk were closed and the reefs in front of Wadao were open. In 2012, it was the opposite. The reefs in front of Maluk were open to fishing and the reefs in front of Wadao were closed to fishing. In 2016, the reefs in front of Baluk were closed to fishing and the reefs in front of Wadao were open to fishing. And in 2017, all the reefs were open to fishing. Now, what we found was there was double the biomass of fish when reefs were closed to fishing relative to when they were open. But interestingly, the main goal of the closure was actually to change 
fish behavior to make fishing easier. What they said was, uh, when you go spear fishing a lot, when you go fishing of any kind, but particularly spear fishing, the fish get flightier. It's harder to get near them. They stay they stay further away. So when they close the reef off for a while, the fish the fish get closer, and it makes spear fishing easier. Well, all kinds of fishing, but particularly spear fishing. So we actually we actually decided to measure this. I ended up getting a PhD student uh, to to uh, to actually study this, and um, he he called it frightening fish for science. Um, but he measured how close you could get to a fish before it swam off. And this is what we call approach or flight initiation distance. And so you can see in Maluk, when it changed from no fishing to allowing fishing, the flight initiation distance increased from eight to 11 and a half feet when fishing was allowed. In Wadao, flight initiation distance decreased from 13 to nine feet when fishing was forbidden. Now, in general, fish were flightier when fishing was allowed. And uh, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. But I think the real cool part here, though, is that we measured the average spear fishing distance. And it was right around 10 feet. So fish tended to stay outside of the range of spear guns when fishing was allowed, but allowed people to get closer when fishing was prohibited. This means that when a fishing ban was lifted, people could clean up and they did. Now, the opening of a reef was marked by a very large harvest to provide fish for a ceremony. Now, people from surrounding villages were invited. Now, the important thing you have to understand is that in Papua New Guinea, your wealth is measured not by what you own, but by what you give away. So there's massive social prestige in people being able to host a ceremony like this and gift fish away. So we asked people um, how they felt this closure system was for their livelihoods, whether it benefited their livelihoods or whether it was bad for their livelihoods, right? And so we just used a five point Likert scale, simple enough for people to understand. We found that about two thirds of people were positive about it. They thought it was, they thought it was good for their livelihood. And about 10% were slightly negative about it. And about a quarter of the people thought it wasn't really bad or it wasn't really good. And remember, that's when Maluk's reefs were closed in 2009. When we went back in 2012 and asked the same question, right? In Maluk, slightly more people were positive about it and nobody was negative about it. In Wadao, um, it started to look, it looked a lot like Maluk when their reefs were closed with about two thirds of the people uh, slightly more thinking it was positive and there being about, you know, about 10% of the people thinking it was, uh, it was detrimental. Now, when we went back again in 2016, in Maluk, again, there, you know, the, oh, the overwhelming majority again thought it was positive, it was beneficial for their livelihoods but there was a small minority of people, in this case about 20%, that thought it was detrimental for their livelihoods. But in Wadao, where there was previously detrimental perceptions, there no longer was. What we're seeing is that negative perceptions were only there when the closure is active. Now, what's going on here? Well, this might be explained by a variation of what's referred to as the peak end rule, or what's known as duration neglect. And what this gets at is that there's a distinction between what people experience and what they remember. Now, people often remember only the ending of experiences that they have. This can include meals, this can include pain, whatever, right? Now, when the ending is pleasant, they often have fonder memories of the entire experience, regardless of the duration. Now, one lesson from this is um, when you're going out to eat, don't worry about your main, invest in a very good dessert, and you will like the meal much uh, better in, in, uh, when you're remembering it. Now, this notion of, of the peak end rule or duration neglect um, uh, uh, was 
uh, sort of inspired by Danny Kahneman, who is a, uh, a psychologist who got the Nobel Prize in, in economics. And um, uh, Kahneman found this in a, a, well, let's call it a rather uncomfortable uh, topic, and that was colonoscopies. And Danny was working with physicians, um, healthcare professionals, to try to improve return visits for uh, patients who were getting colonoscopies. And the, the bottom line is that um, when you receive a colonoscopy, you basically don't ever want to see your doctor again. And people weren't coming back for return visits, which were incredibly important uh, uh, for, for treatment. So what Kahneman suggested was doing an experiment where they decided to do the, do the normal colonoscopy procedure, but leave just w right before you're done, just leave the scope intact for another 20 seconds and don't move it. And apparently this means this is, it's unpleasant, but because the scope is not moving around, it's not painful. Now, the interesting thing here is that you're increasing the total amount of pain that a patient experiences, right? You are increasing the length of the procedure and so increasing the amount of pain that they experience. But because that last bit wasn't as painful, patients recalled the entire experience as being less unpleasant and were much more likely to come for, um, uh, for follow-up visits. Now, this created a sort of conundrum or a moral dilemma in, um, uh, I guess, the medical field because doctors are um, supposed to do no harm. So here you've got a situation where you're actually, the psychologist is, is suggesting do more harm to do good. So I'll let the doctors figure out how that aligns with their, their um, Hippocratic oath. Uh, but anyway, it's an it's a, um, uh, interesting potential explanation for this because if you remember, in Maluk and Wadao, the opening was marked by a very large harvest and better fishing. So the end of the experience was actually quite pleasant. It was like a really good dessert for them. And so when they recalled things later, people didn't recall it being negative at all. So uh, we may have seen that people there, in a sense, by having this rotational harvest system, they may have been harnessing this cognitive bias called the peak end rule. So lastly, you know, we asked, um, uh, we asked people there why they thought they were different from other places, what they were doing differently from, from other villages. And they suggested four interrelated themes of what they were doing differently. And I think these may have some, uh, some lessons. And, and the first was that they had, they, they had unique customs, not only the rotational closure system, which I previously described, but they also had a system um, of fishing initiations that allowed only certain people to access a novel fishery. And that is illustrated here. It's called a bomb bomb fishery. And one, one person paddles the canoe and one person holds a torch which tracks flying fish and long tom, needle fish, and the, the person up front spears those as they kind of fly out of the water. Um, and it's, it's a pretty, it's a very prestigious uh, fishery for people there. And you're basically, um, you only, only certain people get selected to, uh, to, to uh, get initiated into that fishery. Now, both rotational closure and this fishing initiation are, in my opinion, enabled by property rights. There's a marine tenure institutions there which allow these villages to exclude outsiders from the reefs. And this makes it sensible to do things like a rotational closure where if you couldn't do that, there'd be no point in restraining yourself if neighbors could come and, um, and fish it. So the second thing that they talked a lot about was compliance. They, they felt like people actually did a, a, a pretty good job at complying with the rules. And I put this down to what I thought of as a carrot and stick approach. Now, the stick was that people were frequently publicly shamed. They were called out in public if they had transgressed and broken the rules. Uh, but the, on the carrot side was this, this extra fishery that people that were really well behaved and were following the rules and were showing some initiative and leadership were invited to, uh, to participate in. So for people that were following the rules, there was extra benefits. And for people that were uh, not following the rules, 
there was this degree of public shame, which as you know, we're very social species and we're very averse to, uh, to being called out like that. And again, you know, this is a small community and something like that can work in this context. It probably wouldn't work as well in somewhere like New York City. Um, uh, they also talked a lot about participation and they talked about sort of adaptive decision making, um, how uh, they don't just set out and say, okay, we're gonna close the reef for four years they just say it's going to close and we'll see how long it needs to be closed for. Um, and they had a lot of sort of social gatherings. There was weekly meetings in which people could uh, 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 bring up issues and, and discuss those issues. And lastly, they talked a lot about tight social connections. And particularly, they talked about youth elder ties, that the youth and elders were really uh, tightly uh, connected. And uh, we measured this using social network analyses, which found um, tight knowledge and information exchange networks, particularly between youth and elders. And I will just note that all of these are sort of reinforcing, right? The compliance is in part because of the unique customs, uh, et cetera. So what's next for, uh, for this type of project? Well, we're gonna move from bright spots to exceptional responders. Um, in oncology, there's a small minority of patients that have remarkable responses to things like drug therapy. Um, places, uh, you know, 1% of the people do remarkably well and make full recovers from, uh, recoveries from experimental um, uh, cancer drugs. And so what we want to do is find the, uh, the exceptional responders among the world's coral reefs. Where are the places that bounced back from the last global bleaching event or that did really well in, this, in, the, in the COVID crisis, which is forcing a lot of people uh, into, um, into reef fisheries? Right, so let's go over just a couple of the, the take home messages. I think that confronting the coral reef crisis will require embracing a broader range of potential policy levers. Uh, we found that markets were the strongest socioeconomic driver of change on reefs globally. And so are there opportunities to dampen this by coupling conservation with countermeasures? Secondly, you know, I think there's potential to learn from places that have effectively confronted these strong drivers of change. Now, the specific practice that I just talked about, this rotational closure system, may not be applicable everywhere, but there are some transferable lessons. There's benefits of having a system of property rights, of encouraging participation, and leveraging social norms to encourage more pro-environmental practices. And lastly, I think, you know, there's great opportunities to work together outside of your comfort zone, working with people outside of your discipline and thinking outside the box. How can we harness things like the peak end rule, these cognitive biases that people have to, uh, to further pro-environmental behavior? So with that, I would very much just like to uh, thank my lovely family, uh, my social ecological research frontiers team, my amazing research group. And with that, I'd like to say thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. This is a really interesting uh, talk and the discussion uh, is, uh, is the, and the implications are, are very, very useful for, for thinking on policies for managing better our natural resources at the at the not only at the coastal level but also on some other common pool resources that are being affected by by decisions uh, from 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 different um, from different users and and uh, I also like the way how uh, behavioral uh, behavioral economics or behavioral approaches are being used for understanding how how people is be, are making decisions about the about the use of the resources, no? This is, this is really interesting. Uh, thank you. I think it's an amazing frontier. If I could, uh, if I could do my career over again, uh, that might be where I'd, where I'd go into <laughs> is that, that sort of, you know, the behavioral psychology and economics, I find it just so interesting. I love what I do, but if I were to have a second me, I think that second me would do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, and and this is the time for doing it. I, I think this is the, the good time for doing it, and and, and to learn from this uh, neuro economic analysis on uh, how people are making decisions and how they are trying to to uh, uh, 
take the better, the best advantage of, of situations and how it reflects on the use of the of the resources at the end. Okay, I, I have a, a here a question from um, Sven Sea, a professor at the National Columbia University, and um, he is asking uh, you if you can explain uh, uh, briefly the meaning of crowding out and framing. Mm. Okay. So crowding out is, uh, broadly speaking, the notion that, um, uh, that certain behaviors that people do uh, uh, can get displaced when the incentives change. And the classic example of this is from Titmus in 1970. And he found that when people were offered money for donating blood, the amount of blood donated plummeted, right? And that's because people were donating blood because it was the right thing to do. And it was good to help out your uh, other people. But when you start paying someone for that, then it becomes a job. And then, so the, the reward that people get for doing it disappears. It becomes, an, it, it, it's, there's an external incentive rather than the internal incentive of, good civic duty, right? And so we've seen this type of behavior in a whole range of public policy domains. And so this is, this is essentially called crowding out, where when you introduce an incentive, which may make lots of rational economic sense, right? If you like doing it, getting extra money for it, well, surely you'll, you'll, you'll like doing it more. Um, and uh, what we find is actually that doesn't work very well at all. And so there's this whole field of behavioral economics called crowding out. And it really focuses on how the behaviors that we do can be influenced by public policy incentives. Now, the notion of framing is one of the mechanisms through which crowding out might happen. And so one is that the motivations change. Um, uh, the second is this notion of there being this moral diffusion, right? Because you might be in a, a, a situation with lots of other people. But the third is simply that things might get, certain behaviors might get crowded out because of the way that situations are framed or um, uh, how, how might I also say that? The way that a situation is presented can change the way that uh, uh, people behave. And I think the classic example of the framing um, deals with, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the exact details, but basically if you tell people, uh, they gave, uh, it was Kahneman again who, 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 who uh, first sort of quantified this. If you give people two situations and say, okay, look, there's this bad situation that's going on and you can save 97% of the people if you do this thing, uh, would you do it? And most people say yes. If you say, there's this really bad thing, but you're going to kill 3% of the people if you do it, most people will say, no, I won't do it, right? It's the exact same information, but it's the way that information is presented that can really change the behavior. And so they, all, they suggest that this can also be a form of crowding out. Thank you, Yosha. Yes, you're, you're right. Um, I have another question, says uh, Professor Sinner, thanks for the presentation. Uh, some of the characteristics that you described on the village, on the villages where there was this uh, rotation on the closure of fishing uh, are in some way uh, framed within the eight principles proposed by Elidon Ostrom for the management of uh, common pool resources. Have you compared them with this? Absolutely. In fact, there is a, uh, a series of um, papers that uh, I, I've published specifically on that one with um, her former postdoc, Javier Berserto, where we actually looked at the presence of these institutional design principles in indigenous like uh, management systems. Um, he, he works in, in, um, uh, in, in part of Mexico uh, in the Gulf of California, and I worked in um, both Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. So we went through these sort of uh, indigenous management systems and looked at the degree to which these design principles were in place versus not, and a lot of them were. Um, so yes, totally agree. 
Thank you, George. I, I forgot to mention this question was sent by Rocio Moreno. Uh, I have another question from Julian Prato from Universidad Nacional in the Caribbean. And he says, uh, Joshua, thanks for this nice talk. Did you observe it a trend on the bright reefs related with relative small isolated island with close communities and well-defined traditional culture? And do you think religion could help to change people's environmental behavior? So, well, the first part of that, I mean, you know, on one level, every bright spot that we found was on an island, but some of those islands were pretty big. Like Borneo, I think, is the fourth largest or third largest island in the world, right? So some of them are islands, but not all of them are sort of remote islands, per se. Um, but I would say most, yeah, I, pretty much all the bright spots were on islands. We didn't find any on, for example, the, the you know, the continental shelf of, uh, of Africa or something, the, con the, the, the east coast of Africa. Um, and the second part is really about whether um, whether religion can can encourage environmental behavior. And I would say I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for that. Uh, indeed, I think that there is, um, you know, particularly when you I think you you know you look at this uh, the last uh, the recent pope who's really been very pro environmental. Um, and really talking about how critical the, the role of us as stewards of the environment are, um, you know, I think that that provides a, a framework for which, uh, you know, major religions can embrace a different view of people and nature. Um, how much has changed since we had this Pope in terms of our trajectory of degrading Earth's biosphere? I, you know, I think we're still accelerating it. So I would say that a lot more needs to be done. It needs not to be just one errant pope, but I think it needs to be embraced at sort of every level uh, of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we, are, we are very close to, to finish our official time for the Q&A session, but the questions and answers are so interesting that uh, we are going to keep the 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 session for a bit longer instead of moving into a into the into the networking session we will stay here so you can have a more interaction with Joshua I think it's okay for you absolutely okay. fine okay I I will I will then uh, read um, one or two questions and then I will open the the session for the people just uh, raise their hand and uh, they can ask uh, freely uh, as, as all of you, please. But uh, uh, I want to read uh, these two questions before that. Uh, David Sanchez says, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, how to transform a dark spot to a bright spot in the long term to better manage common pool resources? There are examples of transformations. What plausible interventions are useful? So, yeah, I mean, that's that's really the critical question, right? Is how do you move? There was a lot more bright, there was a lot more dark spots than bright spots, right? There was 35 of those versus 15 uh, 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 bright spots. So um, it, what the data would suggest is that what needs to happen is both technological, and so in terms of getting policies that don't encourage the use of destructive nets, getting... Um, uh, you know, the ways in which societies integrated into markets, for example, having fish freezers um, so that they could stockpile fish. So, so, you know, sort of on that one side of that policy needs that. Another side of the policy, though, is that, you know, the bright spots were more likely to have issues like property rights, right? And property rights are, you know, uh, a lot of people would, would consider as a foundation for uh, good governance of the ocean, because if you can't exclude other people, there's not much point in you restraining your own effort, right? So, you know, I think what we saw in the bright spots was that what you need is, a, you know, property rights framework. You need governance that is uh, banning things like destructive nets and um, uh, perhaps a, a, a market-based solutions that don't encourage sort of 
uh, over exploitation. Um, you know, as we think through the other ones, you know, there was really high levels of participation. And one of the things that we saw in Karkar Island was that that participation was really just, right? It was really equitable participation. You know, I mean, there were, there were gendered differences in how men versus women got to participate. And so it wasn't, it wasn't totally equitable, but women did, they were able to participate in decision-making for a, they were not necessarily leaders, but they definitely made their voices heard. And I think that was absolutely critical to success there. So, you know, thinking about ways in which we could have uh, uh, real uh, procedural equity um, in there uh, as well. So I think all of those are, are gonna be critical elements in transforming from uh, dark spots to bright spots. And I would like to see that tested. Great. Right now, I have a, a, a very provocative question from Alfonso Lango. He said, excellent lecture and research. Congratulations. In Latin America, payments for ecosystem services are a mixed blessing policy widely implemented. Based on your research, do you recommend to avoid economic instruments for conservation? Hmm. It's a really good question. Um, so, Yes. Uh, no. So let me let me just say that I agree that they can be a mixed blessing. Uh, that um, there are uh, basically almost all of the research to date on markets and the environment and crowding out comes from the payments from ecosystem services literature. And so there are both examples of payments for ecosystem services crowding out critical behavior and examples of payments for ecosystem services crowding in behavior. And that actually means they can reinforce effective behavior. So um, I think it's, in my opinion, it's too early to say uh, whether it's good or bad. Um, I think that uh, there is a lot of research needed on what are the conditions under which crowding out happens. And this is a new space. And so we're not, we're not there yet, but I would say that once we can get a better sense of when is crowding out much more likely, um, then I think we're going to have a better sense of that. Now there's some great people working in that space um, and they're way more advanced on that than I am. Uh, but uh, so that's kind of happening. Um, uh, th there's, personally, there's a, a part of me that is um, uh, skeptical as to whether uh, more capitalism can improve the environment. Uh, I think, you know, our system in general is one that's uh, set up for exploitation, and I'm not entirely convinced that the solution to the problem is the, is the system that created the problem in the first place. Um, that may sound a bit uh, left uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm not totally opposed to market-based instruments, but I'm also cautious about them. Uh, I agree with you. I, I also tend to believe that uh, uh, one of the problems with a particular instrument is that uh, people uh, want to, to believe that uh, the instruments are one size fits all the problems. And this is not the case for any instrument that you can use. Okay, I will read the, the last uh, the last question and then I will open we will open the the the, the table for open discussion. This is a, a question from Rocio Moreno and she is asking a uh, pandemic could be seen as a closure in terms of behavior of fishers and fish. Uh, so, sorry, what was that? Pandemic could be mm. seen as a closure in terms of the behavior of fishers and fish? So that's going to depend a lot on the context. Um, what we've seen in coral reef fisheries primarily is that it's the exact opposite. So people are unable to travel into cities um, or traveling in is more expensive. So their capacity to get store-bought food has been diminished. And as a result, they are leaning more heavily on, uh, on reef fisheries. 
um, uh, in order to do that. So what we've got um, going on right now is we've got a project where um, we've been working with fishermen for a long time in Papua New Guinea, Kenya, um, and also we were uh, working with a colleague who's um, doing it in St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Um, and so what we're in the process of right now is following about 10 fishermen in each village, uh, and we've got a couple of villages per place, through time. So we're finding out how COVID is affecting their behavior repeatedly over the course of the, of the event. And um, what we're finding is it's uh, in these places, it's much more likely to be driving over exploitation than uh, considering it a closure. Now, that will depend exactly on you know, the local context. If people aren't allowed out of their house, then they're not gonna be out fishing, but many Villages, people, you know, they have to eat, so they're going to go. They're going to go out and go fishing. Yeah, when institutions for sure play a role in all of these yeah. decisions, no? Okay, uh, I think that we can open now the 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 table for the discussion for an open discussion. So, if you want to ask your own questions, please uh, raise your hand, and and uh, Olga will be giving you the the possibility of activating your microphone. Hi everyone, wonderful. So as I'm waiting for everyone to raise their hands, I actually have uh, one or two questions of my own, if that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, first off, uh, Olga here. It was fascinating to hear you speak of Papua New Guinea. I actually lived in East Java uh, for a year a while back. Uh, so, so it was really a unique perspective that you gave from a marine sciences kind of view. So being a behavioral scientist myself, and I wanted to ask another behavioral question. I was just wondering, uh, have you seen duration neglect played out equally across various cultures that you've worked with in different countries, or is it more prominent in, in some more than others? You know, I, I honestly don't know, Olga. They, um, you know, I think this was the first time when we really saw this evidence for it, and that's because we'd been tracking it over time. Um, and we don't have that many places where we've been tracking this over time. Um, so I don't, I don't actually know. And I think that's a fascinating uh, thing to investigate. You know, if you, so, you know, the way that we, you know, so I can't say we actually found duration neglect, but I think what I could say is that what we observed is consistent with duration neglect. Um, I, you know, we didn't do an experiment there to, to look at that. So I think, you know, I think your idea is fascinating. Could you look at cross-culturally uh, actually measure duration neglect. And I think it'd be pretty fascinating. Um, you know, Henrik uh, out of um, uh, Harvard did the series of classic studies where they did that with um, uh, the, uh, the dictator game, right? And they kind of looked across cultures and found that certain cultures have really different behaviors than, than what would be expected um, uh, in there. And we may find the same sort of thing with duration neglect. Because I, I would wonder how Hofstede and the whole cultural competency indicators would affect that. And okay, and and since I'm still waiting for a couple more questions to come in, I'm just gonna I'm gonna see, sneak one more in there. <laughs> uh, again about Papua, like I said, you've piqued my interest, in, and I think it's a fascinating uh, you know area of a fascinating country. So I wanted to ask in your research while you were there in Papua New Guinea. Uh, did you notice any effects of the civil war or any of the gold mining in that region on the marine life there in any way? No, because I was really far away from uh, that province. Um, so that one's right near the Solomon Islands, that's Buka. Um, and it's, it's not close. There's also another, um, there's a big gold mine in Lahir, which is in New Ireland, but I've, I've never uh, worked on that island. So I've not been um, uh, in areas where there's been, so I, I should just point out, so there's, there's West Papua, uh, which is Indonesian controlled, and then there's Papua New Guinea, which is. Oh, sure, um, I spoke. Yes, I was talking about West Papua because that's the part of Indonesia that I visited. Yes. <laughs> right, right. So, so I haven't. Uh, I've only been there once, and that was as a tourist. Uh, so I haven't actually worked on that side. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. So yeah. let's see. We have one question. Okay, so we had one question, who, which was sent to you by Karina. Uh, Karina asked, first she said, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And then she mentioned that yesterday they saw a talk about conservation of the hawksbill turtle 
and the people from the region being educated about taking care of the nest. And the speaker said that there was, uh, there was a monetary incentive involved at some point. He also said that during the pandemic, the community had been doing the job by themselves. It'd be interesting to see those kinds of collaborations from the perspective that we were showing here in your talk. So uh, I, let me give you the best example of, of how dangerous um, paying people for that can be. Now, uh, in 2005, I was uh, walking on a beach in Kenya and out of the bushes comes a man with a bucket of baby sea turtles and tells me he's gonna kill them all unless I pay him. I said, what are you talking about? And as it turns out, my girlfriend at the time was working in the Barbados sea turtle conservation something, and I was wearing that t-shirt. So here I was with the, obviously the turtle guy, because I had a sea turtle conservation thing on my, my shirt. So I was the guy to talk to about that. And so what he said was they'd been offered monetary rewards for conserving turtles, and he hadn't gotten his, so he was going to kill all these unless I paid him. So I, you know, that's, uh, that's a pretty good indication of these external incentives going pretty wrong because he was about ready to slaughter a whole bunch of baby turtles, whereas before he probably wouldn't have cared anything about them. They would have just gone on their way. Uh, so I, you know, I think that these, um, these external incentives, if they're not really well thought through, can, uh, can work it out. Now, the story though, is that the sea turtles ended up getting saved and I didn't have to pay them. Turns out one of my guys on my research team knew something about the whole situation and was able to straighten it out. Uh, so it didn't end in disaster for the baby sea turtles, uh, but uh, it was a moment that's, uh, that really stuck with me uh, regarding um, uh, these sort of payment for, for ecosystem services. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, now we've got a question from Julian Prato. So I'm going to now turn on your microphone. Uh, Julian, let's see. I'm going to request that you turn on your microphone. You're live. Right. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Joshua, for this beautiful talk. Um, Joshua, have you seen maybe that tourism or massive tourism have a, an impact or maybe it's absent in the bright reefs? And what kind of tourism did you see in the bright reef? Well, if that massive tourism could turn a bright reef into a black spot. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just trying to think through. I don't believe that any of the bright spots had any substantial tourism uh, at all. Uh, I don't think there was any, uh, yeah, I don't think there was any tourism in any of the bright spots that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, in, in that place in Karkar Island, I am really, I'm the only person that goes there. They want tourism, they would love to have some extra income, uh, but I think not mass tourism, I think that would, that would destroy it. And I think, you know, I, I've mostly seen tourism managed poorly in ways that don't necessarily Help the environment. There are great. There are some shining examples of uh, sort of ecotourism projects, but uh, I think you know, by and large, mass tourism is not going to help coral reefs. Uh, and then there's also the the broader dilemma that we're all faced with, which is that uh, if people are flying all over the world to go visit a coral reef, uh, and coral reefs one of their biggest threats is global climate change, then uh, we're not really helping the coral reefs by going to visit them. Thank you, Joshua. Perfect. Thank you so much. So now we have another question from Danny. Danny Nambard. Okay, so Danny, I'm requesting that your microphone turns on. Okay, hold on. You are live. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Always Good, a pleasure Danny. to listen to your talks. Thanks to hear from <laughs> Good you. Good to see you. Um, so I was wondering if you considered, it's not particularly socioeconomic, I guess it's more sociocultural, the concept of risk perception 
in the whole play of your bright spots, dark spots, and drivers of reef change. So if there's no necessarily perception that reef condition is um, declining or changing, if that affects people's behavior towards conservation? So uh, the broad answer is no. Uh, we haven't in that context. We've been thinking about it more and more in regards to uh, climate change adaptation and real recognizing that how people perceive risk, what we call the sort of socio-cognitive constructs that people have, how that can really affect their willingness and ability to adapt to change. Um, so I think it's a really critical component. We haven't directly considered it in the bright versus uh, dark spot domain, but I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it may well it may well be relevant. Cool. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> I'm good to see you. <laughs> you too. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, Jorge, did you want to wrap it up with one? Oh, wait, wait. We've sure. got another one. So, uh, Jorge, I think you wanted to ask a question, and then we'll pass it to Stephanie in the audience, and then we'll wrap perfect. up. How about that? Perfect. I want to make sure you get yours into it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Volga. Uh, no, Joshua, I, want, I, I wanted to mention, we, we performed some years ago uh, an experiment with, uh, with fishers in the Colombian Caribbean, and, and we um, compared the possibility of having uh, only inner information from the community, external regulation from the authorities, and uh, a scheme of uh, what we call co-management, putting together authorities, but also uh, community decisions and they perform the better and the best with uh, under the co-management uh, um, scheme and treatment. But what was, was, what was most um, relevant for us was to notice that uh, people that used to fish out of the national natural park that were not related in any way with the officers from the, from the, from the park uh, were those that accepted uh, better the, uh, the condition of the co-management uh, that uh, reduced most the extraction. So uh, given that, um, I was wondering if you have any information about these formal or informal institutions surrounding the decisions and if you have found any correlation of this with uh, the brightness of the spots. Well, I mean, yes, D directly, yes. So we found that the bright spots were much more likely to have informal institutions in the form of uh, uh, marine tenure property rights uh -huh. institutions and these sort of customary practices. Um, and those are all, those were all informal institutions rather than formalized um, uh, you know, environmental laws or statutes. Now, um, in, in a lot of places, though, they were recognized by law. So in Papua New Guinea, customary uh, tenure of both land and sea is recognized by the, by the it's constitutionally recognized. So people uh -huh. actually have the rights to their, their, their customary areas, which is very different to a lot of other places. Um, so again, you know, I think there's a, a, a legal foundation a formal legal foundation that can provide the backbone for a lot of these informal institutions to uh, to be able to flourish. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Olga. Okay, perfect. So our last question for the day, thank you so much, everyone, is from a Stephanie. So a Stephanie, I've just allowed you to be able to open your mic. Okay. Is it okay, already on? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, so uh, hi, Joshua. It was a really amazing presentation. I just uh, wanted to ask if you are planning to do some um, like a similar research on other bright spots uh, in order to evaluate which other strategy, strategies are the communities carrying on on, yeah, like well, other strategies. Yeah. So the next step for us is to, rather than look at bright spots, and let, let me just explain the difference. So in the bright spots work, we used a static snapshot, right? We just, in a sense, took a picture of coral reefs at one point in time, and we looked for reefs that were in better condition 
than we expected them to be. So the next step for me is to actually make that a, a temporal or a time series study and look at places that have a different trajectory of change than we would expect given the conditions that they were exposed to, right? And so yeah. we're gonna move from a static to a dynamic analysis uh, on that. And so that's that kind of exceptional responders, right? That's the analog of the exceptional responders where in medicine, they track patients over time and see who recovers from a cancer diagnosis and who doesn't. And so we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at something similar. And in oncology, what they do with the exceptional responders is they look at the, the genome, the transcriptome and the metabolome. Right, and so there's actually analogs for all of those in a so social ecological context, right? So the genome is the, it's the blueprint for action, right? And so the blueprints in a social ecological context are like the rules in use, uh, the institutions that, that, that are in play, um, the transcriptome, right? That's the process of translating those blueprints uh, into something. And so to me, those are all the processes that are going on. Things like cooperation, things like the diffusion of innovation. These are all the, the processes that we'll be looking at. And then, you know, the metabolome is in a sense, the, uh, the metabolome is basically all the molecules that are involved in, in metabolic processes. And the analog to that in a social ecological situation are the, um, the elements of adaptive capacity, those are the elements that allow you to, to adapt and, and transform and, uh, uh, and, and act. So we're going to be looking at the social ecological context, the processes, and the levels of adaptive capacity in exceptional responders, poor responders, and uh, sort of average responders.